All right, let's get right into this. So here's the basic thing. There is something that occurs almost every single time that benefits are taken away from an individual from their social security benefit options. So I'm talking about social security disability insurance benefits, supplemental security income benefits, and many of the others, DACs or DACs or disabled adult child benefits. This is the system that they use, the weapon of choice when answering, what does the SSA use to remove benefits, to take away benefits? The weapon of choice that the SSA uses is called the eight-step sequential process, and they utilize it through, of course, DDS, which is Display Determination Services, who basically begin the process through what's called a CDR, a Continuing Disability Review. So let's go through this real quick again. DDS is the group. These are the people that are going to actually do it. CDR is the method by which they're going to begin the process, and the eight-step sequential process, the weapon, the weapon of choice, is what they're going to use to review you to potentially remove your benefits. So what we're going to be going over in this video is essentially how that weapon of choice works so that you better understand specifically the way that they adjudicate your claim when seeing if you should keep your Social Security benefits going forward. All right, here we go. This is from the POMS or Program Operations Manual System. Let's get right into it. This is DI 28005.015. Again, DI 28005.015. Uh, for all the people that will comment down the line saying it's not a real rule, it is. Stop doing that. It is. These are all real rules. All the rules that I bring to you are all real rules. Or they're in the Federal Register, they're SSRs, they're POMs, they're HALEX, they're all real rules. All right, here we go. Discussion of the eight step Title II and adult Title 16 CDR sequential evaluation process. Here we go. All right, so this subsection corresponds with the numbered steps in the chart located in DI 28005.010. Let's just get right to the stuff, though. Step one, okay? Step one. So this is the first element that they use potentially to hurt you or remove your benefits going forward, okay? So once again, this is, this is element one of how they do it. Step one, substantial gainful activity. Now, step one of the eight-step sequential process, when you're getting reviewed to see if you can keep your disability benefits, is the same as step one of the five-step step sequential process when you're seeking benefits for the first time, okay? Subqu uh, substantial gainful activity. So what is SGA? The first step in the CDR evaluation process is to determine whether the individual is performing SGA. Put another way, are you working and earning over $1,550 in 2024? This is a field office responsibility and determination. The FO determines if disability ceases based on performance of SGA and determines if the SGA exceptions applies, CDI 28020.050. So put another way, the local field office, if they get a heads up from the IRS that you're basically earning over $1,550, guess what? You violate element one of the eight-step sequential process, which will sometimes trigger a CDR, which will mean that they will be using the eight-step sequential process on you. Cool. Now, with that said, SGA cessation determinations are not applicable to Title 16 cases, SSI cases, for work performed after June 30th, 1987. For additional information on this issue, see DI 28075.600. Okay. Since SGA is not a consideration in the sequential evaluation process for Title 16 disability recipients, proceed directly to step two below. We'll go into that in a minute. I just want to go more into how element one is actually applied here. Okay. In concurrent, that means both SSDI and SSI. SSDI, you paid to play program for disability benefits. You paid taxes, FICA taxes to get your higher paying disability program. SSI, right? Title 16 cases. Those are basically your no pay to play. If you haven't worked enough or haven't worked at all in the United States, you go on to that. The program of last resort. It sucks. It's not enough money, but it does give you a check every month and Medicaid. So it's basically barely enough to survive on. All right. So in concurrent Title II and Title 16, that means SSDI and SSI cases together, an individual whose Title II SSDI benefits benefits ends due to performance of SGA may retain Title 16 eligibility during the trial work period right? Nine month trial work period. You guys know how that works. You get nine months to go ahead and basically try out different jobs where it's not going to injure you because you get nine, do whatever the hell you want months. You can make a billion dollars and still keep your benefits in one of those months. Or when deciding whether an individual continues to have a disabling impairment for purposes of an extended period of eligibility, 
or other work incentive benefits. Okay, so instead of you're, you're now outside of the trial work period, then you go into the 36 month extended eligibility period. Same kind of gig. You're getting a buffer there. All right. If a Title II or concurrent Title II, Title 16 case, so if you're on SSDI only or SSDI and SSI, contains documentation of a work incentive program, such as a trial work period or an extended uh, period of eligibility, do not send the case to the field office for development of SGA. The SGA exception cannot be applied to cases involving a TWP that is in progress. So that's the system that they use to say, hey, field office, don't screw the pooch on this claimant because they're allowed through the TWP trial work period and extended eligibility, uh, extended uh, eligibility program, you know, where you get that 36 months to have those earnings on the record. So don't send them over to the field office. You're just going to waste their time because they're allowed to have those earnings. Now, if the Disability Determination Services, DDS, or if you're in Georgia and you think you're cool, DES, identifies a scenario for a Title II or concurrent Title II, Title 16 beneficiary whom continues to engage in work activity, activity after the completion of the trial work period, the extended period of eligibility, and the field office has not addressed the work activity or has not documented that an unsuccessful work attempt was considered, unsuccessful work attempt, UWA. That's just where you work for like three, four months. You get fired, unsuccessful. You couldn't keep it with the job. You know, a lot of people are like, I can work, I can do it. And then they start, you know, month one, they're, I'm going to ride this pony into the lightning. And then they get to month two and they're like, I'm having a hard time with this Shetland pony. And then you get to month three and they're like, please find me a way off this horse. That's literally how most people are when they're disabled and they try to work. All right. So uh, let's say, so let's say they try a UWA. Uh, they look at that. Was that considered? The adjudicator should return the case to the field office for SGA development. Okay. So basically, if uh, you know, you're know you making money, you get to use your trial work period, you get to use your uh, title, uh, whatchamacallit, your, your extended period of eligibility, you get to use your unsuccessful work attempts, right? But then after that, after that, they're sending you to the local field office for an SGA evaluation. Are you earning over the 1550? And that'll bite you in the butt, it really will. Once the FO has resolved any work issues for SGA, right? The adjudicator must identify the CPD. After identifying the CPD, <clears throat> the, the adjudicator can continue to step two of the CDR sequential evaluation process. For additional information, uh, basically go see DI 28010.020. All right. So now I want to go ahead and test you guys because some people will always put into basically the chat section that they know uh, what something is or that they're, oh, they're perfect and they got this and got that. I want to see how many of you guys actually know what a CPD is, okay? So let me know in the chat section right over there what you think the CPD is, and not just what it is, in like if you, if you like Google it or whatever, not just what the actual wording is, but I want you to tell me what it is, like what, what it actually means. So guys, I see some hands up like this. They're not sure. What is CPD? Let me see how everybody's doing in the chat section. Anybody know what the CPD is? Anybody? I don't know at all. Your life is over. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. I have no idea. No idea. Okay. Okay. What? Let's see. Uh, it'd be hard to get. Uh, okay. That uh, I don't know exactly. Just a smiley, cryly face. All right. I'll tell you what the CPD is. All right. CPD. CPD stands for basically the comparison point. <coughs> dying. Comparison point decision. What is the comparison point decision? All right. When you had your last like adjudication, your last decision. So let's say you got found disabled and then you had a CDR and they said, hey, you're still disabled. And then you had another CDR. The, the comparison point decision is usually the last decision that was made about whether or not you were disabled. Okay, right here. That's the CPD, comparison point decision. So if you're found disabled back in the day and they do a CDR and they still say, hey, this guy's still disabled. And then you get another CDR. That's the last one. That's the comparison point decision. So it's the last time you had a decision from the SSA. That is what the CPD is. That is what a comparison point decision uh, uh, is. Okay. All right, cool. <clears throat> now we go on to element two of the weapon that removes benefits, right? We did element one. Element was SGA. Now we go to element two. Element two, okay, meets or equals a current listing. 
Now, before we go through this, let me just give you a little summary as to how that works, because the SSA has never been great at explaining what a listing is. A listing is a predetermined list of impairments in categories, special senses, eye, nose, ear, neurological, cardiovascular, right? Uh, respiratory, musculoskeletal. I'm not sure how to show that. Just movement and groove and range of motion, right? So, you know, stuff like that. Mental, right? Your 12.0s, okay? So listings are lists of impairments inside categories of impairments. And they're defined as like, you know, this is how bad you have to be to meet them. So the way the SSA looks at it is they do a three-word test. Test one, do you meet, equal, or exceed? Do you meet, equal, or exceed one of those predefined severe impairments? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reword it so that it makes sense to a normal person, okay? Do you meet, are you as bad as it is, as that one that's written there? Do you equal, are you equivalent to it, right? Do you exceed it, right? Are you worse than that thing as it's written in their listings, right? So basically, or put another way, and this is what the Supreme Court said, do you have medical equivalency to a listing, okay? That's basically it, okay? So bottom line is, predefined list, got to be as bad as one, worse than one, or equivalent to one, all right? Cool. All right, <clears throat> let's read through it. And if you are, normally you're found disabled at that point. That's just, you're, you're there. Okay. All right. So review the evidence in the file and document the individual's current alleged impairments. Then determine whether any impairments meet or equal or exceed a listing in the current listing of impairments. Okay. Cool. In the current listing of impairments. So we go to, if yes, find that the disability continues, analysis stops, Everything is good. You continue to remain disabled. Everything is a mas bueno, right? So bottom line is if you meet equal or exceed one of those listings, everything is cool to go. Everything is super dupe. Everything is rock on. Cool. Next one. If no, go to step three. Now there's a note here. Note, at step two, we do not consider whether the individual's impairments uh, was impairment was at the same time of the CPD, nor do we consider the basis for having found the individual disabled previously. We consider if any impairments the individual currently has meets or equals a current listing. All right, so let me explain that real quick so that the way it's supposed to work is that they're always supposed to consider you against the rules where you were found disabled back in the day. But at element two, this is like a quick, like, uh, you know, you know, quick way of saying yes, this person is still disabled. So what they do is they look at the current list of rules, of listings, not the old one when you were first found disabled, but the current list. And if you currently meet that new list, right, bottom line is at that point, you will be found disabled at element two. But if you don't, you have to go to element three. So that's the thing. It's their quick way of saying, oh boy, this person's really bad. They meet our current standards. You know, let's not waste time on the CDR kick it down the road so that basically, you know, we'll review this person three years, five years, seven years, whatever. And remember, when you meet listings, you're almost never on the one-year review. You're not getting the one year, the one year, the one year, the one year, okay? You get more like the three to five to seven years, more like the five to seven years if you meet equal or exceed the listings. And here's why. When you're found disabled, there's, there's low shitty ones, right? Vocational allowance. And then there's really bad ones up here, right? Where they're like, oh, that person's never going to be great. Those are compassion allowance listings. So like when it comes to severity or like the best kind of approval you can get is a compassion allowance listing followed by listings, followed by grid outs, followed by vocational allowances. The vocational allowances are the weakest kinds of approvals. The compassion allowance listings are the best kinds of approvals for not having CDRs. But the kicker is if you have Unfortunately, a compassion allowance listing, you're probably not going to live that long. You're probably bed bound. You're one of those two types of categories. All right. All right. Now we go to element three of the weapon that the SSA uses to see whether or not you are still disabled under their rules and regulations. Okay, here we go. Step three, medical improvement, MI. That's what it stands for. So when you hear me say MI, it means you got better. And when I say MI, what I'm really saying is the doctor said you got better or the machine said you got better or you went to some therapy thing and the therapy guy was like, well, the insurance isn't going to pay for this unless I say you're getting better. So I better say you're getting better. And then all of a sudden you're screwed and you got evidence against you. Cool. Now that we have that medical improvement, MI. Review the CPD evidence. All right. Now we went over this. We went over this. What is CPD? CPD is the comparison point. Decision, right. Comparison point decision. That is the decision 
of the last time they adjudicated you and found that you were disabled. Cool. Review the CPD evidence and identify relevant medical signs, symptoms, and laboratory findings for the same impairments that were present at the CPD. So what they're saying is we're going to look at the old decision that we made. We're going to apply that and look at how it changed, or maybe it's the same, or maybe it's different to the new decision, right? They're doing a, a comparison, right? They're doing the my little teapot. Okay, is this person back in the day, you know, essentially worse than they were, or are they, or are they, are they doing worse now, or are they doing better now? Are they feeling, are they feeling terrible, or are they feeling good, right? Don't say I said to use the my little teapot theory of uh, doctrinal justice for the eight step sequential process. It will get me in trouble. All right, so here we go. Let's read it again. Review the CPD evidence and identify relevant medical signs. Now, I don't. You guys probably don't know what this stuff is, but there's like specific meanings to this stuff. Medical signs are symptoms that can be measured by science, right? Cool. So it's like, you know, discoloration of skin, maybe of heart flutters, maybe you got hypertension. Like we can measure that symptom. And then they say symptoms. Symptoms are like things that we can't measure, right? You got a, you got pain. We can't measure the pain, right? And then laboratory findings, <clears throat> you know, that's blood tests, machine tests, stuff like that. All right, review the CPD evidence and identify relevant medical signs, symptoms, or laboratory findings for the same impairments that were present at the CPD. Then compare the signs, symptoms, and laboratory findings for the same impairments at the CDR, right, continuing disability review, the thing where they're reviewing you to see if you're still disabled, to determine whether there is a decrease in the medical severity of the impairments at the CDR. So what they're saying is, did you get better? Are you not as severe? Are you happier in life? That's what they're saying. For medical improvement to occur, there must be a decrease in the medical severity of any of the impairments present at the time of the CPD. So what they're saying is, if any of the old impairments that you had at the prior adjudication got better, are less severe, then they're going to come for you. They're going to come for you. Okay. Minor changes in any CPD impairment do not demonstrate medical improvement. <clears throat> but again, the courts haven't ruled prefer preferentially with that whole situation. But let me read it to you again. Minor changes in any CPD impairment do not demonstrate medical improvement. Your brain is thinking, oh, oh I got that. No, the courts don't are very supportive of what you're thinking with that. Next thing, for additional information related to medical improvement, CDI 28010.000. I'll do a video on that. That's, that's, no, let me, let me get out the, I don't even have a pen on me, but I have this like 19, 60s uh, Russian made, uh, you know, fancy pencil. I'm just going to circle that, put a little star next to it. Oh, I accidentally drew on the laptop. That's not good. Sorry, laptop. That's okay. We didn't destroy it yet. All right, good, good, good. Let me go ahead and retract the uh, the pencil that came from, uh, you know, obviously <clears throat> someplace other than America. All right, so now here's what happens. Decide whether medical improvement occurs. If there is medical improvement, you go to step four. If there's no medical improvement, then you go to step five. So if there's medical improvement, you're doing better, and they're like, ah, we're coming for those benefits, then you go straight to step four relating to whether medical impairment, uh, you know, whether they can go ahead and do other types of jobs in the national economy. If there's no medical imp uh, improvement, then we go to step five, which is... <clears throat> I'll read it for you real quick. Step five, the exceptions. And that one's, that one's, we'll go through that one once we get to it. All right, step four, relating medical imp improvement to the ability to work. So here's where we're going to look at essentially, could you go back and do a job in the national economy? All right, let's rock through this thing real quick. Here we go. When determining if medical improvement relates to the ability to work, consider only, only, that's an important strong word in law. Consider only the CPD impairments. So that's the original impairments from the last adjudication, the last ruling, the last time they said you were disabled. Consider only those impairments, not all the new medical problems you have, only those impairments that you had back in the day. And if applicable, consider age and time on the roles instructions. Okay, so don't worry about that. That's just going to complicate stuff. But remember, they're only looking at right now with this particular element, the past impairments you had and whether your impairments got better. And if they got better, are you able to work? Now, there's two mechanisms to determine if medical improvement relates to the ability for you to work. 
And this is important because the SSA uses this to literally kick you off of disability benefits. Number one, prior listing mechanism. If the basis of the CPD, the prior ruling where you were disabled, was meeting or equaling a listing and the individual still meets or equals that prior listing or any of the subsections of that listing as it appears at the time of the CPD, the prior adjudication, including a listing that has since been revived or is now obsolete, then the medical improvement does not relate to the ability to work. Let me read it to you again, but first, just the facts. Thank you. Thank you for the $20 donation. I really appreciate that. Let me read what you put there real quick. Uh, I'm a disability attorney in Northwood, Florida, who is now semi-retired. I take two cases a month, of course, cherry uh, picked and do, and do all the work, except I have part-time LA. Our OHO is uh, tally. Could you accept cases in Northwest Florida? Yeah, 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 I, absolutely. Yeah, no worries. Absolutely. Um, we actually have cases all over uh, and that was the big thing. Like the, 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 they're all over the United States now. They're in all of the possessions, which, which is one of those things, guys, just so you know, if I ever disappear for like three or four days, it's because there are literally islands in the Pacific and islands in the Atlantic where potentially I could fly to partake in a hearing for a claimant that's in one of the possessions of the United States. It's incredible. However, what ruined that? And my fun is that now a lot of stuff is telephonic. So it just it ruined it. That's, you know, but that's okay. That's no worries. But um, again, just the facts. I really, really appreciate it. That's awesome. So definitely catch up. That's very, very cool. So uh, here's the deal. I want to read to you guys again that one because that one's tricky. I'm just going to read it through quickly and then I'm going to give you a summary as to what they're saying there. If the basis of the prior ruling was meeting or equaling a listing, right? So if the prior ruling said that you met a listing, that you were like pretty darn severe, or if you want to be cool, call it marked. Marked means severe in SSA land. Then what that means is that, and the individual still meets or equals that prior listing. So, okay, now this is important. They're saying at the prior ruling, that you were disabled, you met a listing, right? Now, if you still today meet the legal standard for that old school listing, not what it's been changed to today, or any of the subsections of that listing, usually part C, but we're not gonna go into that, uh, as it appears at the time of the CPD, including a listing that has since been revised or is now obsolete, then medical improvement does not relate to the ability to work. So in other words, they're saying, they're like, hey, just a heads up, you're good. If you met it back in the day, you're super, super dupe, right? You're still disabled. Here's your Pop-Tart. There you go. You're good to go. Here's a hug, right? So that's good. They don't give hugs. They're not very good. I've had a few. All right, so let's get right to it. Now, with that said, for consideration of prior listings, CDI 28015.050, blah, blah, blah. If the individual's impairments met a listing within a time period at the CPD, right? CDI 28010.029, blah, blah, blah. A summary list of changes to the listing of impairments and the effective date of the changes uh, is located at DI 20. It's all this stuff. I'll cover it in other videos. If you guys enjoy this video where I explain to you exactly how they take away your benefits, like the exact specific law, like let me know. I'll do I'll do more videos on each specific topic, and then I'll link them together in a playlist. Um, now, with that said, if you guys ever want to look at the old listings, the obsolete ones, the ones that you could have been found disabled on, because you know the SSA is famous for not going ahead and properly adjudicating a CDR on the old listing standards. Like the the, the thing will get to the hearing or have to go to appeals council and get remanded all the time because they use the wrong listing standard. So like this is important. So obsolete versions of the adult listings may be located at DI 34100.000 or DI 34200.000. Cool. I'll do a video on that so you guys can see what some of the listings were and what they are now because and but the, you have to keep in mind the big change isn't necessarily the, the the listings and how they write them out. Sure yeah, they have changes, but the big change is the culture of the types of evidence that the judges are looking for that prove in their brain that you really do meet the listing, right? That's what changes because everything's written so very, very broadly. So when they do changes, even if they're just little changes, eh, that's not the big thing. It's the culture of the SSA that's really getting people kicked off of social security benefits for the disability side. All right. Now remember there are two mechanisms. There was a prior listing mechanism, right? If you meet the old listing, cool beans. Part two, 
residual functional capacity RFC comparison mechanism. Now, remember what we remember what the RFC is. The RFC is the ings, right? Walking, standing, pushing, pulling, crouching, kneeling, stooping, remembering, focusing, blah, 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 blah. Here, here, let me let me give you some of the, I'll give you some of the ings. All right, I'll jazz you up with some of the ings over here. Um, let me go over to uh, mini RFC. I'm going to jazz you with some, some ings. All right, so what are we looking at when we look at basically the ings? We're looking at sitting, standing, walking, bending, climbing. Uh, ramps, stairs, ladders, ropes, scaffolds, reaching, right? Waist to chest, uh, above shoulder, uh, squatting, stooping, crawling, kneeling, crouching, balancing, lifting, carrying, uh, pushing, uh, pulling, uh, handling, seizing, holding, grasping, turning, fingering, picking, pinching, feeling. Uh, by the way, fingering is like typing on a keyboard for some of you that have a mind that's not fully developed, just like mine is. All right. With that said, they also look at acuity of your eyesight, depth, perception, accommodation, color, vision, hearing, speaking, talking, tasting, smelling. Cool. Remembering locations. And now we're getting into the mental. So if you guys are like, oh, I have a mental impairment, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, you know, this is, this is your section right here. Remembering locations, work like procedures, understanding short instructions, detailed instructions, oral instructions, written instructions, completing simple instructions, detailed uh, instructions, concentrate, extended periods, perform within a schedule, maintain regular attendance, be punctual, be tolerant, maintain an ordinary routine, coordinate with others, be within proximity to others, uh, not be distracted by others, make simple work decisions, keep pace with others, complete a normal work day. Uh, interact with the public appropriately, ask simple questions, request assistance, accept instruction from supervisors, take criticism from supervisors, get along with coworkers, peers, not exhibit behavioral extremes, continuously retain cleanliness and neatness. And then we're coming down to the final ones. Respond to work changes, take precautions for hazards, travel in unfamiliar places, use public transportation, set realistic goals, make plans independent of others. And then we get to the final category, which are the environmental ones. So these are, these are important because some of you guys have impairments that are affected by what's called environmental restrictions. I don't know why I added the extra finger there, but they're environmental restrictions. Cool. With that said, okay, just to keep going through it, these are things that they look at to see whether or not your impairments are going to be limited based off your ability to be in these environmental restrictions. Exposure to weather, extreme cold, extreme heat, wetness, humidity, noise, vibration, fumes, odors, gas, dust, poor ventilation, working in high exposed places, exposure to radiant energy, exposure to toxic chemicals, exposure to cleaning chemicals. Okay. So when you're like, hey, what do they mean by this RFC thing? What's this whole RFC thing about? What they mean is those things, right? Your ability to do work-related tasks and also stuff at home, right? Residual functional capacity. And always break it up into two categories. You got your work category, and then you got your home category. And if you have a different category, that means you're Elon because you're Mars, right? He's out there over there. So that's the, hey, all right. I don't know why I went with that. I don't know where I was going with that. I just totally like, just, just remember work and home. I don't know why the Mars thing. I've been thinking about Mars a lot. I don't know why it worries me. Anyways, residual functional capacity comparison mechanism. If the CPD, the prior adjudication where you were found disabled was based on medical and vocational factors, compare the findings in the evidence used to support the CPD RFC. One more time. If the CPD prior adjudication was based on medical and vocational factors, okay, medical and vocational, which means like, can you do a job? Are you able to function doing a job? Okay, so that's what they're looking at here. Compare the findings in the evidence used to support the CPD RFC. So when they see CPD RFC, what they're saying is, okay, let's look at this thing. What were the residual functional capacity limitations of that person at the prior ruling. Is it similar? Is it not similar? Have they gotten better? Have they gotten worse? They look at what your ability is to do those things we just went over, okay? All right, in the evidence used to support the CPD RFC with the findings in the evidence for the same impairments evaluated in the Medical Improvement Review Standard RFC. That's the MERS, but again, Medical Improvement Review Standard RFC or other assessment documents such as SSA 416 UF if the CPD impairments is not severe at the CDR level. I'll go through the SSA 416 in another video, all right? Now, here's a here's a warning thing that they give to their to their employees. Do not attempt to reassess the CPD RFC if there's no improvement in the individual's ability to perform related work tasks, not home work tasks. This chair is literally going to break on me. I have to, I have to change it out or else I'm going to die 
on YouTube because this chair will fall. It's going to be terrible, but I, but I'll do it smiling as I fall and like grab the whole thing and it falls on me. You, you guys will at least have a short video from that. That'll be good. I'll post it later. Now, with that said, I, I'll live through it. I hope let's see if there's no improvement in the individual's ability to perform work related tasks, then am I medical improvement does not relate to the ability to work for the additional information on RFC assessments, see DI 28015.300. But bottom line is, can you do any work? Have you had any medical vocational improvement? What is medical vocational improvement? Can you get along with bosses, you know, bosses, coworkers, friends, family, the general public? Are you able to take work? Are you able to ask questions about what you're doing? Are you able to do those functions? Okay, now next one. Decide whether the medical improvement relates to the ability to work. If medical improvement does not relate to the ability to work, go to step five. If medical improvement relates to the ability to work, go to step six. Okay. So what we're looking at here is, okay, okay. If, if they've had medical improvement, does it relate to a vocational situation where they can maybe do some work? If we do, we go to step five. If medical uh, improvement relates to the ability to work, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Then we go, sorry, sorry. I did that wrong. One moment. Let me think. Here we go. Okay. So if you do not, if medical improvement does not relate to the ability to work, right? You haven't seen like improvements there. It's not, you know, you couldn't go get a job, yada, yada, go to step five. If it does relate to your medical improvement shows, well, maybe they could go work at a, you know, at a grocery store, being a price checker, a price marker, a cashier, or whatever. If you do have that improvement, you go to step six. Okay. Step five exceptions. All right. Now, step five is um, a little bit tricky, but we're going to get through it because we're almost towards the end. We only have to go to step eight because it is the eight step sequential process. And if you guys ever wonder why I sometimes seem like I'm mentally really on top of things, but then also not really mentally on top of things, it's because I work all day. I woke up super early, had a hearing, 8.30 a.m. with a judge and a claimant. Super fun time. There was a party, of course. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, then the day just continued until we basically got to here. And it's 10.05. All right, here we go. Group one and group two exceptions to medical improvement permit a finding that disability ceased in situations where even though there has been no medical improvement or medical improvement is not related to the ability to work, Evidence clearly shows that the person should not longer should no longer be considered disabled or should never have been considered disabled. Okay, let me read it to you again. That way we can kind of go through it. Group one and group two exceptions, which we're not going to go through this video because we'll go through them a little bit. We're not going to go into detail because that's yeah, element five is like a whole can of worms. Okay. Group one and group two exceptions to medical improvement permit a finding. They allow finding that disability ceased, right? So this is where potentially there was like, you know, a, a killing of the disability that existed, right? So, you know, you could potentially lose uh, essentially benefits through this situation. Okay. So group one and group two exceptions to medical improvement permit a finding that disability ceased in situations where even though there has been no medical improvement, or medical improvement is not related to the ability to work, evidence clearly shows that the person should no longer be considered disabled or never should have been considered disabled to begin with. So these are the special exceptions element, right? This is the one where it's like, wait a minute. The SSA is like, we screwed up. We should have never given this person benefits to begin with. And that kind of falls into this section. There must be evidence supporting the finding that a group one or group two exceptions uh, exception are applicable. If the evidence does not support the finding, then the adjudicator should not apply an exception. You don't want exceptions. Exceptions are bad. You don't want an exception here because if you got exceptions and there's proof of it, they're going to try and remove your disability benefits. The group one exceptions apply at step five of this sequential evaluation process and may result in a finding that an individual is no longer disabled. You don't want a group one exception. Group two exceptions. Group two exceptions can apply at any step of the CDR sequential evaluation process and do not require determination that an individual has medically improved or can engage in SGA. We'll go through the exceptions later. It's, it's a whole can of list, but we'll go through them. That way you know what they are, okay? Because remember, we got to keep this video pretty short. I want to keep this video under 45 minutes. Decide whether an exception to medical impairment applies. 
If no exception applies, no group one exception, no group two exception, find that the disability continues. So in other words, you don't want an ex you don't want an exception to apply. Exceptions apply, you're in a shitty situation. That's a no bueno. Class five, no bueno. Number two, if one of the group one exceptions applies, go to step six. If one of the group two exceptions applies, then, sorry, if one of the group one exceptions applies, go to step six. If one of the group two exceptions applies, then the adjudicator may find that the disability ceases at any point in the eight-step CDR evaluation process without a medical determination. So group two, like, exception, if you fall into one, bad day. They can just stamp you canceled right there. You've been canceled the way the SSA can only do it. So that's, that's a no bueno. All right. So again, if one of the group one exceptions applies, go to step six, right? So here we go. So if it's group one exception, we're going to go to step six. Severity of current impairments. Severity of current impairments. All right. So now we're at step six of eight of the eight step sequential process that they use for CDRs to try and remove your benefits. It is the weapon of choice by the SSA to take away your SSDI, SSI, et cetera, plus other program benefits. Step six, severity of current impairments. Decide whether the individual has any severe impairments and assess the current RFC considering all current, that's the important word there, all current impairments. Why am I saying it weirdly? Because before we were mostly dealing with just your original impairments. Now we're saying, hey, does this person have some more problems? What's going on? Why does this person have even more impairments? Well, let's call it like it is. Everybody that's on disability benefits, a couple of years goes by, there's usually more impairments that you add onto the list, right? So in that situation, just to clarify, just to simplify, bottom line, this is where we start to look at if you have more impairments that could potentially, if added onto the pancake pile, would make you disabled. Okay, excellent. Cool. Here we go. Decide whether the individual has any severe impairments and assess the current RFC, the current residual functional capacity, your current ability to do stuff, considering all current impairments. Our policy defines a severe, a severe impairment as an impairment that causes limitations having more than minimal effect on an individual's capacity to perform basic work activities, which is really the shittiest version of any definition you could be like, oh, this is what you need. It's totally useless. I don't even know why they put it in there. You, you would need at least five paragraphs to fully, fully explain what severe means to the SSA, specifically for each impairment that you might have. Okay. Now, if applicable, consider age and time on the roles instructions. Cool. All right. Now, if the individual's impairments or impairment has medically improved but remains severe or current impairment is not severe, the DE proceeds to step seven, okay? Then they go to step seven, okay? So if they're saying, okay, look, if an impairment went from extreme to severe and it still remains severe or current impairment is no longer severe, then they want you to go to step seven. Conversely, if the individual's comparison point decision impairments, so what are, what are CPD impairments? All right. We're taking a break. We're taking a moment here. I want everybody in the chat who's watching this to tell me what they think CPD impairments are. You tell me, except for the disability attorney that's watching this right now, don't, don't help them. You tell me what you think CPD impairments are. You know what CPD is. We went over it multiple times. It is the prior adjudication. It's the last adjudication you had that said you were disabled. So what do you think CPD impairments are? Let's get the roll up here. Let me see in the co comments. Are we seeing anything? Uh, I'm not seeing anybody jumping in. Let's see some brave little texters right here. Uh, Carol said lung problems. That's that's definitely not it. Uh, is anybody? Nobody. Nobody's saying anything. Everybody's, just, everybody's afraid. All right, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yes, it is the comparison point decision impairments. It's just the impairments that you had at the last adjudication. That's all it is. That's all it is. So the impairments, not that you have right now, but the impairments you had at the last adjudication. Conversely, if the individual's CPD impairments, the impairments you had at the last adjudication, have medically improved, they've gotten better, right? And there's no evidence of a current severe impairment, a cessation is appropriate. Cessation means they're cutting off your benefits. That's a no bueno. That's a bad, bad thing. Determine if the individual currently has any severe impairments. Once again, determine if any, if the individual currently has any severe impairments. If yes, prepare the RFC assessment and go to step seven. If no, find that disability ceases. In other words, they have killed off any potential of benefit 
for your disability to continue. So bottom line is this. You're not going to have disability at, at that point. You go through a cessation. Now you can fight it. You can be in the process of going through that. A lot of people do. We get calls all the time. Every single, every, literally every single day, we get at least five calls about uh, basically these, you know, cessation of benefit situations. So if you're in a situation where they're saying, ah, you're just not severe enough anymore, then we now go to element seven. Remember there's eight. So we're running out. We're running out of runway here. All right, here we go. Step seven, past work. Okay. If the individual's combined medical conditions, all of them, all of them, every single one, the ones back in the day, the new ones. Well, it's really all the current ones. It's really all the current ones. That's what they're looking at. But all of them, right? If the individual's combined medical conditions impose limitations on their current RFC, like you can't do stuff, pushing, pulling, crouching, kneeling, stooping, et cetera, et cetera, consider the individual's capacity to do their past relevant work. So the question then is, okay, could this person do what they did back in the day? Now, remember, they're changing the rule on that. And the new rule is instead of 15 years going back, they're only going to be looking at five years as of June, right? So they're only going five years back. They don't want to know what you did 15 years ago. They don't care, right? As of June, they're going to, when you're going to be like, oh, 15 years ago, I was a welder. Life was good, blah, blah, blah. They're going to be like, sir, we need you to zip it. We don't care. We only want the past five years in which you worked at uh, the ice cream store handling the panini machine, which of course I would have loved. That would have been the best job for me. Now, with that said, do not consider work during the current period of disability or current period of extended Medicare as relevant work experience for expedited reins. Oh, okay. So let me read that to you again. Do not consider work during the current period of disability or current period of extended Medicare as relevant work experience. So they're limiting what kind of work they can use against you. For expedited reinstatement cases, EXRs, you guys know what they are. Do not consider work that has occurred since the CPD. This will not be considered past relevant work, or as they put it down, PRW. If the vocational evidence is not sufficient to evaluate past work at step seven, adjudicators may consider use of a vocational expedient. Okay, we're not going to go into that because I'm shooting for 45 minutes on this video and we're at 41 videos. Decide whether the individual has the ability to perform their past relevant work. If they do, find that the disability benefits cease. They end, they terminate, they're gone. They are Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? They're gone, they're done. They are terminated, right? Very good, excellent. I'm glad you're on board with this. Number two is an option. So part two of, op of element seven if no, right, so decide whether or not the, the individual has the ability to perform past relevant work. If no, they don't, they can't do the past relevant work, then you go to step eight. Just, just as a side thing, step seven is very similar to step four in the five-step sequential process when you're like shooting to get disability benefits. But once you have disability benefits and you're basically going through a CDR, the reviewing you, when you get to element seven, it's like the same thing as basically, it's very similar to basically element four in the five subsequent process. But for today, in this wonderful, amazing script time, we're going to be going now to step eight, the final, most amazing, most ridiculously overpowered element of the entire eight step sequential process known as the cleaver of the CDRs, the mighty hammer of Thor with the bloodline of Arnold Schwarzenegger running through him. All right, let's get into it. Step eight, other work. If the individual's current medical condition, like what's going on medically with them right now, precludes performing past relevant work. They can't do the past jobs. It ain't going to happen. Stop asking them. Or there is insufficient evidence, right? We can't figure it out. We don't know. There's not enough evidence regarding the individual's past relevant work. Consider the individual's ability to adjust. And this is the cleaver. This is where people get screwed over. Adjust to other work. Ugh, it's terrible. It's not a good thing. Adjust to other work existing in the national economy by considering the RFC, what they can do on a daily basis, and the vocational factors of age, education, and work experience as appropriate in the case. Decide whether the individual has the ability to do other work. All right, now let me explain this. Let me explain this because this is the part a lot of people don't get this. They're like, I can't work. I can't do other jobs. Blah, 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 right? They go into Wookiee mode and they just, you know, they, they do that stuff. Here's, here's the thing. All right. Let me just, let me just frame it down. Let me put it right, right there. Okay. Here's the thing. 
When they do this, they are looking at a dictionary of occupational titles in the SEO, like the, the two bookies, right? The two books. And when they do this and they look at this thing, they're like, oh, well, you know, the, they look at, well, okay, maybe they could do this job and make it, they, maybe they could do that job. And there's this whole book of jobs that they think you could potentially do. So here's the kicker. When you sit back and you're like, there's no way on heaven and earth that I could potentially work. That's not how they really look at it. They break it down into what they think you can do. Your math reasoning, right? Do you have skills, prior skills from prior jobs? And they apply all of that to see whether or not you can do another job in the national economy. And the kicker is a lot of those jobs, especially the SVP one and two, the very simple ones, they're going to find or try to find that there are jobs you could potentially do at element eight. That's why with the five subsequential process, when you're trying to be found disabled for the first time, element five is the cleaver. In the eight step sequential process where they're trying to review if you're still disabled, element eight is the cleaver. Because they're always going to try and find other jobs in the national economy that you could potentially, I don't know why I'm staring over here, do. So that's what you need to know with this whole thing. All right. Let's go through this real quick. Uh, if yes, that there are other jobs in the national economy that they, that they could do, this hypothetical potential claimant, also known as you, right? If yes, find that the disability ceases, which means they take your benefits, you're sad, you have to appeal. If no, you couldn't do other jobs in the national economy, find that disability continues. Fireworks, enter video now. We can always add them later. Now, note, consider borderline age situations. If an individual is within a few days to a few months of reaching a higher age category, and they're talking about grid out jazz, and using the chronological age results in a cessation. Consider using the higher age category if it results in a continuance after RFC age, education, and work experience have all been evaluated. Specific criteria must be met. See DI 2505.006C for information on identifying a borderline age situation. I have to do that rule because I quoted that rule wrong at a hearing. Just because I don't know. I don't know why I did it. I, I knew what the rule was. I just quoted it wrong. So as my punishment, we're going to be doing a video specifically on that rule right there. All right. Now, with that said, I have gone through the eight-step sequential process, which is the tool of destruction or removal of disability benefits that the SSA uses to remove your Social Security disability benefits when adjudicating you to see if you are still disabled under their rules and regulations. Once again, element one. Substantial gainful activity. Are you earning over the 1550? Element two, do you meet, equal, or exceed a current listing? Element three, did you have medical improvement? Element four, are you able to do some work as a result of the medical improvement, right? Starting to figure it out. Element five, which is just the exceptions. That's all it is, exceptions. Step six, or element six, severity of current impairments. Are your impairments now, the new ones, super duper bad, right? Element seven, can you do your past work? Element eight, can you do any other job in the national economy under the DOT with semi-skilled, skilled, or unskilled as options? <sighs> the cleaver element. All right, we have officially gone through the massive war hammer, the massive lightning sword, the massive Kelly Clarkson singing all she's got note of a tool that the SSA uses to deny you benefits going forward. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. Of course, I have been drinking a little bit too much tea. As you know, there's a lot of caffeine in it. It gets me excited. We will be catching up the next video in about 15 minutes. I need to turn the AC up more because I'm sweating. You notice that shine? That's all natural. That's all natural. Very nice. I will catch you guys in the next video. Please remember to like and subscribe. Uh, don't be stingy with the likes. Also, please go to Google and type in disability resolution. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, leave some stars up there. Disability Resolution Florida, Disability Resolution Law Firm. Um, also, this Thursday and Friday, I will not be working full days. Thursday is my birthday. And on my birthday, I always work full days. But this one, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing it. I'm convincing. I'll probably end up doing it, but I'm not doing it. Also, very important. Uh, please remember, during 9 to 5, if you have questions and you're already on benefits, don't call the firm. Only call the firm if you're seeking to get a lawyer to work on your claim to win benefits. Don't call up with like, I just have a quick question. We get like 300 of those a day. Just the, the staff is ready to put me in a box where I'm not 
alive. So that's important. Okay. Uh, final thing, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I go live pretty much always on YouTube now because I just like it better than Facebook. And uh, it's getting, it's usually late, 10 ish, 11 ish. I'll go live and I'll answer questions. You know the deal, 407 279 1754. It's in the bottom uh, bio below. You call in, I answer questions. We have a good time. There's lots of pizza. I'm just kidding. It would be nice if there was pizza. I will catch you guys at the next video in about 15 minutes. Have a wonderful, wonderful night, and I will see you shortly at the next video. Thanks so much. And we will go from there. And remember to take care of yourself. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.